People gathered across the country for a historic event today, a total eclipse of the sun in a 70-mile-wide band crossing from the Pacific to the Atlantic coast. With special eyeglasses or homemade boxes, tens of millions looked to the sky to witness a sight not seen in most people's lifetimes. Our science correspondent Miles O'Brien was in Idaho to watch for us and in partnership with our colleagues from the PBS program NOVA. Miles gets a started, and then he and William Brangham discuss the day's celestial and earthly events. It is the first coast-to-coast -coast American eclipse in a century. Millions had a front row seat for a celestial minuet of moon and sun. We got to Charleston yesterday morning, came up because this is in a path, and we could come. When you can, you should. So we came to see the eclipse because it's a once-in-a-lifetime deal. I've never seen an eclipse, so I figured this was my chance <clears throat> since it's so close to Chicago. Beneath a 70-mile-wide path from Salem, Oregon to Charleston, South Carolina, day turned into night for two minutes or more. Woo, baby! It thrilled the public and the experts alike. Yeah! Williams College astronomer Jay Pasikoff was among them. He has traveled the world for years chasing eclipses. This is his 66th. No one has seen more. Pasikoff is drawn by the beauty and the scientific opportunity when the moon appears to swallow up the sun. And then this white corona appears. All around you, it's dark, and uh, it's just a wonderful experience to have. And there's great science that you can do only on the days of eclipses do we see the corona appear. So we want to take advantage of that as much as possible. Understanding the sun's corona is a priority for scientists. Among the mysteries, why is it hotter than the surface of the sun itself? But there are practical reasons as well. Sometimes the corona breaks free of the sun's magnetic field, causing a coronal mass ejection billions of tons of hot plasma moving at 2,000 miles per second. Normally, the Earth's magnetic field deflects most of the highly charged particles. But every now and then, a large coronal mass ejection can overwhelm our defenses, disabling satellites and causing power outages. Bill Murtaugh is among the scientists watching this space weather for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Boulder, Colorado. The biggest event they ever saw came in 2012. This is what we saw. All of a sudden, that flare occurs, the eruption occurs, and that blast it was tremendous. Very big, very, very fast. Fortunately, it did not hit Earth, as it would have caused widespread power outages. A total eclipse is one way scientists try to better understand coronal mass ejections. We would love to improve our capability to predict if we can better model what the magnetic field might look like within the eruption, then we'd be in a great place. NASA and the European Space Agency have sent several craft to study the sun over the years. The next big mission, the Parker Solar Probe, is slated for launch next August. It will fly through the corona itself, gathering data. But no spacecraft can match the teaching opportunity provided by a total solar eclipse, which occurs when the Earth, Moon, and Sun are perfectly aligned so the Moon blocks the Sun's light. The Moon is 400 times smaller than the Sun, but also 400 times closer to the Earth. So from our vantage point, they seem to be the same size. But total solar eclipses happen rarely because the Moon's orbit is tilted five degrees and is elliptical, so sometimes it is too far away to completely obscure the Sun, causing a so-called annular eclipse with its distinctive ring of fire. The last total solar eclipse visible in the continental United States happened in the northwestern corner of the country in 1979. Of course, Jimmy Carter was president back then. That eclipse was in the northwestern U.S., ideally suited for Washington state. This time around, Washington, D.C. wasn't a bad place to watch. President Trump did so, briefly forgetting to put on protective glasses before he finally did the right thing. William? 
Uh, so, Miles, you were there in the actual shadow cast by the, by the by the moon on the face of the United States. Tell us what the, for those of us who were here outside of that shadow, what was it like? You know, William, I've never seen a total eclipse of the sun before. This is my first experience with this. And of course, we've all seen the pictures and the films. The experience of, of being in it is um, uh, surreal. Uh, it's the combination of all the, the senses that are involved, the temperature dropping, the light becoming this ethereal kind of blue, and then suddenly darkness at noon for a brief period of time. I stopped looking through the welder's glass and looked up there at the sun or what was the sun, this disc with this amazing aura around it. And I, I was truly gobsmacked. I was at a loss for words. It, you know, we think we're all so advanced and evolved, but I think it appeals to us in a very fundamental kind of limbic brain place. It's sort of um, an instinctual response that you have, which is difficult to put into words, but it was, it was spectacular. And I understand you were with a rather unique band of scientists and enthusiasts out, with, out in Idaho with you. Tell us about who you spent the day with. It was like the United Nations of astronomy here. People from five nations here, many of them operators of planetariums, some of them amateur astronomers, a few professional astrophysicists, some of them doing some actual science here. What I liked about this and what I like about covering science in general is it does afford opportunities like this that really do bring us together. And we live in a time when things that bring us together seem to be in short supply. So it was really nice to see us in this particular place come together and really in many respects, the country kind of saved this moment together. You reported several times about how crucial today was for science. And I'm just wondering, why is it that we have to wait for an eclipse to, to do these sorts of measurements? Can't we put a filter on the telescopes or the devices that we use to measure the sun? Why, why do we have to wait for the moon to actually block it? You know, it's interesting, you can think about it, you could just cover the sun with your thumb, right? And maybe you get the same thing. Doesn't work that way. It's important to have something in space that does the blocking because the atmosphere gets in the way of the science. Uh, if you have uh, as something, coincidentally, the moon being 400 times smaller than the sun and yet 400 times closer, makes it a perfect disk to occult the sun, creating that clean view of the corona, which you really can't get unless you're in space. And so. So this is an opportunity for science. There are there are probes that are, that, are, that are gone to the sun and will go to the sun that will get all kinds of other types of science. But this d does give scientists a great opportunity to further understand the corona and its behavior. So the last one of these was in the late 1970s. Today was obviously a historic event for the U.S. When's the next one? When's the next chance we might have to get a gander at something like this? April of 2024, only seven years away. By quirk, this is happening. It's roughly, as we said, about every 18 months, an eclipse happens somewhere. Any given place on the planet, the odds are one in 365 years that you'll see a total eclipse. Put that all into the, the Rubik's Cube and you get another American eclipse from Texas all the way up into Pennsylvania, New York, and into Maine in seven years time. And I, having done this one and seen it in person, I can tell you, William, if I'm around, I will be there seven years from now to see it in person. All right, fantastic. We are always grateful for our Miles O'Brien, but especially on days like today. Thank you so much. You're welcome, William. Just a marvelous day. And remember to stay with PBS tonight for NOVA's special Eclipse Across America.